Again, these muscles are far from mobilized into the hip, but more important than the knee. And they're the ones that make your knee go straight. Remember that, one second. So here, you probably have a bad hip. If you have to, if you have difficulty getting the car, you've lost range of motion. So now you've lost motion, and now you have nighttime pain, now you have daytime pain, and then finally, if you can't walk without pain, then you have a lack of endurance. So it's going to be harder for you, again, to recover from a hip or knee replacement. Endurance, strength, range of motion, pain. Now, everybody has both the soft and the hard tissue pain. So let's see how this figures, let's see how we treat some of this. Patients should participate in low impact aerobic activities such as walking and biking. Walking by definition means that one of your feet is on the ground every single time. Running by definition means both feet are off the ground at the same time. You do not want to run on a bad joint or even a replaced joint. Quadricep strengthening is not only suggested, but now we have a prehab program where quadricep strengthening is a major part of that drill. Range of motion and flexibility exercises provide no benefits, so just moving your knee isn't going to get you where you want to go. Braces, don't waste your money on the braces, and moreover, Medicare is not going to pay for it. So if you go to a doctor's office and say, you know, try this brace for this knee, for this knee problem, uh, if you want to put this knee on because it makes you feel better, okay. But otherwise, don't spend 700 bucks on a brace because it's not going to make you better. Okay? You can't change that bone on bone phenomenon. You just start to put weight on it, the brace is not going to make that better. It's not going to stabilize your knee to any extent. 25 BMI. Does anybody know? I'm 5'8, 159 pounds. My BMI is 24.6. Okay? Now, right now, that's not an important number, but in the next year and a half, that number is going to become very important. Glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, don't waste your money, it's not going to do you any good. Acetaminophen and non steroid anti inflammatory agents are what's truly recommended for pain relief. And for those folks who may not be aware, there is a tremendous narcotic problem in America today. And in the last two months, I got a letter from the Commonwealth of Virginia saying that now the new rule is in the Commonwealth, if you don't go to surgery, I can only write you a narcotic prescription for two weeks to include tramadol. If you go to surgery, I can give you two months of narcotics. After that, on either case, you have to go to pain management. I can't give you another prescription. If you come into the office and, you, and I have, we've not seen you before, the state mandates that I look you up on a computer, and if you have a prescription for a narcotic, I cannot give you a narcotic prescription. So the, the, the FDA sent us, but not the FDA, but the uh, DEA sent us a letter two weeks ago. And basically what the letter said was, dear physician, we have a big problem in America with narcotics. We want you to help. This is how we want you to prescribe narcotics. I said, well, I think, I can, I think I've got this in hand. So I can keep a card. But the point is that we are truly, there's a big, big push in America to get away from narcotics. After 10, 15 years ago, saying that something like one just to treat me came with that scale one to 10 pain, oh, crap over. Well, anyway, now we can't treat it, so we don't give you a point. You're not getting narcotics. But in a way, that's good. If you have problems with GI distress, take Celebrex. Okay, and you can use up to four grams of Tylenol all day. So basically, strengthen your quads, use Tylenol, non strength inflammatory agent, and don't have a lot of extra stuff on because it's not gonna work, for the most part. Now, if you have the soft tissue pain, you come to the office and say, well, I'm pretty good during the day, but it's at the night, and I have swelling in my knee. Gonna give you a steroid injection because that's only gonna help the soft tissue pain. Soft tissue pain on that exposed bone is like water on concrete, won't do you a bit of good. Maybe for a week or two, but that's about it. If you do have hard tissue pain, then we'll try a series of injections called two parts or intra-articular hydronic acid. 
this is a protein. The hyaluronic acid is a protein that we all use to make the synovial fluid in our joint. So the way it works is it's a mega dosage. It does help you, but it's not everlasting and it's not, it is not a treatment. It is just a kind of like a delay tactic. So if you use the steroid injections and or if you're gonna use the two parts, it can buy you some time. A lot of folks in this community travel. So what we'll do is then once you come out of the office, like a week before you go or whatever, just inject your knee, give you some temporary so you can enjoy your holiday and we'll see you when you get back. And those guys who don't want to get it done in the summer, when they inject their knees with supervisors, they say, we'll see you hopefully in the winter. Uh, but this is a unique, unique community in that there's a lot of traveling going on, which is really kind of good for you folks, because this is the time you need to do it. So we've got a few little things that we can do to help you relieve the pain temporarily. None of them treat your pain permanently, okay? Now, please, 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 if you decide to see somebody else for your arthritis, do not, do not, do not let them scope your knee, okay? Do not let them do that, because it's only gonna, prob probably only gonna make it worse. About 15 years ago, um, I had a series of, Fortunately, I had a series of about six or seven patients that came in after we scoped their knee, you know, for arthritis to clean you up. And uh, one after another said, you know, Dan, I really like you, but man, my knee's much worse off now after the arthroscopic surgery than before surgery. Because unfortunately, unfortunately, in the VA hospital, some of these folks have to wait a long time to get something done. Well, somebody was kind of brilliant and took advantage of that. And they took 250 patients with arthritis and gave them arthroscopic surgery to clean them up. And they took another 250 matched patients, same age, everything, and they followed them for two years. The patients that did the best were the patients who didn't have surgery. Okay, so please do not get your knee scoped. Now, there's one caveat. Um, if you have, if you come into the office and you've got bad arthritis in that compartment, and you, there's a clicking or popping sound that causes pain from the meniscus, that I'll go after. But I will also tell you that we're not going to get rid of your pain from your arthritis. Okay? This is really critical. And, and the, the, the underlying story is not every meniscus needs surgery. Every meniscal tear does not need surgery. If you have arthritis, ask your doctor, do I have arthritis on my knee? And he's looking at the x-rays. If you look at the x-rays now, you know what to look for. And if you see that, forget it. Don't waste your money. It's, it's only going to be worse. Questions so far? <laughs> I'm amazed. If I'm going too fast, just please stop me. Yes, sir. I got a question. On the cortisol and the uh, WD-40 injections, Yes, sir. are those required before you get into the knee replacement, is that steps have to be met or? <laughs> you know, uh, six months ago I would say no, but now I just got audited from Medicare and they said, Dan, you did not mention whether or not the person got two parts or steroid injections. So it really isn't, but if they review the charts, that's what they're looking for. Yes, sir. I, like you, uh, did 21 years of uh, uh, genteel poverty in retired military. What about TRICARE for Life? How does that cover this stuff? Well, TRICARE for Life, they, they do a pretty good job of covering yeah, it. Yeah, they usually do. They usually do. The problem is that it's the Medicare part. Okay. The Medicare part, if they have, and as everybody knows in this room, the way Medicare goes, the way everybody else goes. You only have five insurance companies left, big ones. And maybe in the next year, we're only going to have three. <laughs> and so the DOJ is worried about that. I mean, I, I don't want you guys to worry about how it's all going to work out. I mean, but you do have to kind of think about it. Because it, it is going to change. And it's changing every single time. Okay. So what if when you delay using the injections or whatever, are you risking additional harm to the joint? Well, the more bone you have exposed to your knee, the more pain you're going to have. You're going to probably you're going to get weaker quicker because you're not using the quads. And then what happens is you get a, your knee develops a flexion contracture because your quads isn't strong enough. So what happens? What happens is the longer you wait, your quad muscles become weak, so you can't straighten out your knee. So you bend your knee and you walk with a limp. And you walk with a limp, and the back of your knee now becomes stiff. Now when we go in there, we can't do soft touch surgery. We got to take it all down. 
So if I don't have to take all that tissue down, I can tell you, if I go in there, and, I, and, I, and a, a lady or uh, a person comes in and the knee is essentially straight, they're gonna do better than somebody comes in with a 10 degree bent knee. Because I gotta go in the back of the knee and release all that tissue and get rid of all that bone in the back of the knee. And if it's straight, I don't have to do that. That recovery is much quicker. Plus, when your quadriceps are stronger, when you get up that first day, because you will walk the first day of surgery. You will walk. <laughs> and the stronger you have that quad, the better you're gonna do that first walk and the subsequent walk after that, and the quicker you're gonna get released to. So do you recommend a lot of therapy prior to the surgery? There is a pre program that we have, and what it is, it's very specific, because it tells you that I think the more you know about what's gonna happen, the better you're gonna do. And they give you exercise, and they, and they teach you things that you need to know, and things that could hurt you, and things that could help you. So that's, thing, that's one thing that we've done. It takes a little bit of cash, but I think in the long term, we get big results from that. It makes a big difference. If you, the more you know, every single, most of what you, the questions you're gonna ask, they'll be asked by, they'll be answered before you go to surgery. That's the critical part. And what happens too, if your knee, when you lose that medial compartment, if you lose that medial compartment, your tibia is going to go like that. If you lose the outside department, then you can get that deformity. Again, if you have a deformity when you come to surgery, we can't do a very nice soft touch surgery. We have to make different bone cuts, we got to take more bone off, we got to do more soft tissue stripping. It just makes it, and we can do it, no doubt about it, but it makes it different because the more inflammation you have in that knee, the more pain you're gonna have. The more I gotta strip, the more I gotta cut, the more you're gonna feel it, okay? That's not so much true in the hip, but it is in the knee. So, we wanna make things as good as possible. So, the safe surgery technique we have at Centero, we have introduced all of these red lines. These red lines, um, you can't violate them. In fact, I don't even know much of them. We lay down the law. Our nurses tell us, Dan, you can't do this case. Dan, you can't do this case. No, you can't, whatever. And they'll tell me why I can't. And then you come in, we'll show you what these red lines are. But we don't violate these red lines because in my opinion, they tell me I have to have a line, but I get to draw the line. Okay, I don't make it so strict that it's impossible and get to make it so lenient that, that your care is gonna be compromised. So this is, the, this, this is what we're talking about. The, this first line is the red line of the hemoglobin of greater than 10. The hemoglobin measures the amount of blood in your system. You got to have enough blood to get up, not be dizzy, and be able to cooperate with physical therapy on the day of surgery. Not the next day, but the following day, the day of surgery. So we all demand that if you're gonna go to surgery, you have to have a hemoglobin of 10. We're going to do both sides, both hips, and both knees. Hemoglobin has to be 13. And if we don't get that number, it does, the surgery doesn't get scheduled. Okay? So we want to decrease the number of blood transfusions, which is another matrix that CMS uses, you know, the Centers for Medical and Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid. They look at that. Again, that's high, boom. Check comes back. If you're a diabetic, your hemoglobin A1C has to be under seven. Because we know if it's under seven, we're gonna decrease the chance of infection. So, and we also look at your glucose around the time of surgery. And for those who are diabetic, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But even those who aren't diabetic, your sugars tend to go up, so we have to be very careful. We change the fluids and we do a couple things to keep your sugars under 140. But the more higher that sugar goes up and the higher it stays up, the more chance you're gonna get an infection. The next one is the MRSA swab. Not every hospital does that, but we do the MRSA swab and the methicillin uh, staph aureus, methicillin sensitive staph aureus, this is methicillin resistant staph aureus. Everybody's heard of MRSA, not everybody's heard of MSSA. <clears throat> but in order to go to surgery, you have to have a swab of your nose that's negative or a swab of your nose and have been treated for five days before you go to surgery. Because that would decrease the chance of, of that infection. That is the worst, <laughs> the worst. Uh, it really uh, doesn't ruin my day. It makes my day absolutely horrible. Um, and it makes the difficult procedure after that for the whole problem. And 
you know, I, no matter how good we get, I think right now our, our infection rate um, at Sentara uh, is right at 1%, which is really, really very good. This is a very, very clean hospital. And we have taken the voluntary limit, at least we have, we're gonna limit the number of joints we do up here because I don't want the process to get so overburdened that the people who are preparing the instruments make mistakes or we get too busy that we can't do what we wanna do. We're not here to try and do 10,000 joints a year. We're here to do 300, 350, you know, very well without complication. That's what we're trying to do in a very safe way. So we've got, we've got to cross this red line. Um, now, again, BMI. So comprehensive care for total joints, remember that's this project that went into effect in April this past year, April this year. Again, my BMI at 5'8", 159 is 24. Okay, no big deal. Why not? If I were to get to 265 pounds, that's a lot of weight, my BMI would go to 40.3. Now, these folks, Medicare says, that, well, if you go to England, if you go overseas and your BMI is over 40, you will not get a total joint replacement. When I lived in Spain, we never get anybody whose BMI was over 40, even if you were at the doorstep and the nurse put you on the scale and took your height and you didn't pass, you didn't get surgery. Go home, you can buy and have a good day. Now, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. But I will tell you that there's a strong, strong effort to tell us don't do anybody over 40. And what they do, what the hospital does, this one included, is they'll mark your chart and they'll mark the fact that you are obese because that is a red flag to Medicare. Now, it is a good thing because it does decrease the risk of infection and it does improve your post-op function. We do know that if you tend to carry a little more weight, you're not gonna function as well as somebody who's thinner, okay? It's, it's not a positive or negative thing, it's, it's just the way it is. But the BMI right now is a strong recommendation, but it will become a standard, it will become a red line probably in a year or so, a year and a half. So, and we have some people right now who we are waiting. Now, in my mind, why is this important for me? Well, here's what, I, I can get past the 40. I can't get past the other ones. I can let you drift up to a 42, maybe a 42 and a half. But here's the key thing. Those patients who have a uh, BMI of over 40, if you look at my knee, you can see my knee through my scrubs. There's very little fat between the skin and the top of my kneecap, okay? Why is that important? In my mind, this is what happens. When I cut through that skin, cut through that fat to get to that patella, that fat is killed with my argon knife. So I use gas, a lot of people use electricity. So that tissue is dead. It has to be, because I've cut through it. So if that wound, if that incision allows a bug to get in through that incision and infiltrate and infect that fat, that fat will go to the next incision into your knee and infect your knee. Because most people who have a BMI of 40 have a pretty good layer of fat between the skin and the top of the kneecap. In my estimation, that's what happens. That's an easy explanation. You have to know the reason. If you got all if you got all this fat up over here, and you've got a skinny knee, I'll do you. Here's the thing, well, that person don't need to suffer. I will do that one. That's very easy. <clears throat> this is a very applicable, applicable in this environment. Philosophical age of seventy-five. In my mind, if you, when, you review, when you review the literature, you'll see that those patients over 75 have a higher incidence of cardiac and pulmonary events that usually occur within the first 90 hours after surgery. <coughs> so, what I tell my total hip patients who almost always go home the next day, if you're over 75 and you don't feel too good, you just wanna stay, I'm okay, you can stay, it's all right. But if you're under 75, you're out the door at 23 hours. So don't, don't even pack a bag because you're not going to need it. Just get ready to head out the next morning. Now, I got a friend in Pennsylvania. He does 
all of, most of his needs outpatient, and those patients go home in eight hours. Yeah, well, that's not what we want to do. But right now, our length of stay for total needs is just a little over two days. Okay, but if you um, can't make it, if the grade isn't there, every now and then somebody will stay an extra day. Right now, our discharge to home rate is 96%. 96% of our patients go home. Less than three or four percent go to skilled nursing facility. You gotta stay in the hospital for three days to do that. Okay, you gotta have three nights in the hospital, so Medicare rule. You can't go home faster than sooner than three nights. I don't know why, but they do. The comprehensive care for total joints changing that. You only have to stay two. But the penalty for that is now the period of observation for readmission came goes to 90 days. 90 days is a long time. Now, what does it mean? Say you say I do your knee and you go and you get pneumonia and you get readmitted, I take the hit. Say you go over there and you get to have a heart attack and you get admitted, I take the hit. If you happen to have renal failure, I get the hit. The only way I don't take the hit is a major trauma or cancer. But every other reason why you get admitted to a hospital, a urinary tract infection, whatever, I take a hit. I don't get the tricks, it all comes back to me. So we want to make sure everyone is nice and clear before we go to surgery. So let's talk very briefly about what everybody's worried about, and that's pain in the total name. Okay? This, this, this slide right here, we made up this process so that we can get you guys in and out without a lot of pain. So fundamentally, the femoral nerve comes in the front of the leg and provides um, sensation all the way down to the knee to the sides. It does not get the back of the knee. If I inject the femoral nerve up here with an anesthetic, you won't be able to straighten out your knee, okay? Because the nerve goes to sleep so the muscle doesn't function. But if I go further down and put the anesthesia down here, I'll get the anesthetic effect, but you'll be able to move your knee. So we did that. We changed from a femoral nerve block to an adductor nerve block so you can move your knee and still get the anesthetic relief just because Medicare says you need to move. The second thing we did is we added this drug right here. They don't want me to use this drug because it's a little expensive, but for me it's worth it and for you it's really worth it. So what happens is we inject these 50 million fat-released little um, bubbles of bupivacaine and it takes eight hours to set up. So while that block is coming down, the expert was going up. And I can get very good relief for if we do it on a Tuesday, all of Tuesday, most of Wednesday, and into Thursday maybe. So there'll be a little bit of a rebound of pain, but by then we've given you some medicine so that the inflammation goes down, so when you rebound, it's not back up again, it's just a small little bounce. Okay, and some people don't bounce at all, some people bounce a little bit more. But in general, with the combination of the adductor block and this Expirel makes a huge difference. Huge, huge difference. Because you have to go to PT. Have to go to PT. One of the beauties of this hospital is that you will not, you have to go to PT unless the physical therapist calls me personally and gets my approval for you not to go to PT. In the last year, that happened never. <laughs> because I know what I'm going to say. So don't let me wrap my ass up there and do it myself because they are going to PT. You've got to go. You've got to. And, and, I mean, I know you've heard horror stories. Well, this guy didn't do so good, this person didn't do so good, this person did great, this person did fabulous. It's all physical therapy, it's all what you do. And if you train for the race, you overrun the race very well. If you don't train, if you don't try, if you don't know what you're doing, you're probably not going to do as well, okay? And we don't want that to happen. That's why all our efforts are to get you to where you need to go. Now, blood preservation. <coughs> we do not, do not, do not like to transfuse blood because um, what most people don't know is that um, the worst complications, the most common complication from a blood transfusion is not an infection. It's getting the wrong blood type. Mm -hmm. And if you get the wrong blood type, it's a whole different scenario. I can take the game. 
really? Tranexamic acid. It is a drug that we use IV or in your incision so that the clot doesn't go away. It doesn't form blood clots, but very locally, when you bleed, when you form a clot, this medicine gets rid of all of those proteins that make that clot go away, because we want you to clot in your knee or in your hip, because we want the blood to stop. So if you get the blood to stop during surgery, then you don't have a loss of blood. And, and we have not used a drain in a knee or a hip probably for like five years now, because it increases blood loss because you're just sucking the drain out. We used to think, we used to actually believe in the we used to have a drain where we'd suck it out, put it in a bag, and put it on me and give it back to you which made no sense to me in my mind, but that's what it does, bless you. Um, and they also cause infections. As a matter of fact, we don't even use a tourniquet now in their knees. So we've really come a long ways to where we were and where we are today. And this is my famous icon blade. I, I didn't make it, but I use this. They don't like for me to use this, but this is really fabulous because this is the key thing right here, less necrosis. If I'm going to take a risk, and you got a little bit more fat underneath that skin between that kneecap, I don't want to. I don't want to burn that fat. I don't want to melt it with electricity. So I use argon gas. Argon gas burns one quarter the depth of electricity. So if electricity burns you at an inch, argon gas burns you at a quarter of an inch. And that means what? Less inflammation. That means what? Less pain. Okay. And what it does, because of that, because of less necrosis, risk infections, it decreases your post-op pain because I'm not causing inflammation. And because of that, I don't have to use a tourniquet. And it's really, I would say now, before, when we used a tourniquet, we used to, we put the tourniquet down, everybody gets ready, get the suction ready, get the electricity ready, and you start putting out fires all over the place. You're chasing these bleeders. If you don't use a tourniquet and you use an eyebound blade, as you bleed, I just, just hit it. So we keep up. They give me the blood pressure I want. We very, very closely will follow your blood pressure. The anesthesiologists know that. They get me like right at 100. You guys are sleeping with no difference. And then I just, just do things as I go along. I just stop it. And we don't, not even, I can see everything I need. So we haven't used a tourniquet in probably two and a half years now. And that, some people come back with bruising and probably be pain across the quadriceps. Don't touch the quadriceps. Leave the quadriceps alone so we don't use a tourniquet. We don't need it because our blood loss now uh, on a hip is about 100 and about on the knee it's about 150 cc's, which is you won't even know it's a difference. If you start off at 10, you go to 9. You still have plenty of blood to do what you got to do. Regarding the blood, I've seen recommendations that sometimes donate your own blood in advance. Do you ever do that? No. No, absolutely not. No, I don't think we've, uh, we stopped, I stopped that long, long time ago. <coughs> You don't, I, I personally, I would never recommend that because we just don't see that. Uh, there's, I don't see any need for uh, getting an extra expense to go to the blood for Red Cross and get some blood for the fire. So, I just want to show this one slide here um, because this is kind of important for total knees. So that's the hip, that's obviously the knee, that's the ankle. So if you draw a line from the center of the hip to the center of the knee, center of the ankle, that's called a mechanical axis. The reason why we look at that mechanical axis is because there's a lot of literature that says that if you can get that to zero, our eyes can only go to three degrees, but if you can get that to zero, that one variable alone can extend the survivorship of that total knee maybe as long as 20 years. Okay, so if you're 45, that's important. If you're 75, it's not important, but I tell you what, a zero degree knee moves better than a knee that's bent, even three degrees. So we really, really, really try to get that, and that computer gets us to zero. We use a computer that helps us line it up. Now for the older folks, the reason why that's even more important is because if I know exactly where those implants are gonna go, I don't have to dissect a lot of tissue. I can stay right in the midline and just take a little bit off, just enough room to get the implant. So I don't have to go dissecting all over the place. Just straight down the middle. And that's why we like to use, we use a computer to determine that to the mechanical axis. Mm. And uh, this is not, this is only an important one right here because 
the metal, the titanium in the hip, and the cobalt chromium, and the titanium in the knee, those obviously aren't going to wear out. What's going to wear out is this bearing surface, the piece of plastic that's in between them. Like this piece of plastic here that goes between the knee, uh, knee components. I don't see a hip one. But this wears out. This wears out at a rate of 15 microns a year. So if you're going to heaven, it's going with you. <laughs> you're not going to wear this baby out. You're not going to wear this ball out. That was the big, that was the big that problem before, but we don't have that problem anymore. And that's one of the big, big things. So anybody, that probably won't know anybody talking in the metal on metal beds. That's, that's a, just check out your checkbook and write a number on it because it's going to give that to the patient. Ceramic on ceramic. Uh, the only problem, ceramic on ceramic is a very, very good bearing surface. The problem is if it squeaks, it's an automatic condition. You gotta take it out because you won't be able to tolerate that. But it will squeak. Not all the time, but some of the time. So if you get a squeaker, it's an automatic condition. You say, Dan, take it back to that room now and get this thing out of me. I can't stand it. Um, small incision surgery for those of all you guys who like toe hips or need a toe hip or even think about a toe hip or your neighbor needs a toe hip. Dr. Joel Monica is out in California. He's the one who popularized the direct anterior hip. And that's this little incision in front. I'll show you that in a second. But that's really, really, in my mind, one of the greatest things that's come along in the, probably in the last 10 years. We've been doing it almost 12 years now. But um, John um, um, Kegel, Keggy up in, in Connecticut. As a matter of fact, I, was, I had just left there a little bit before, but we knew he was there. And he was doing it to the front. Everybody else was doing it to make these big long incisions on the side. And at Yale and places out there, so on, this is the way to do it. And John was going to the front. And by 2003, he'd already had done 2,132 of them. So he was way ahead of the power curve. And these are his numbers. I mean, look at his infection 21.3%. I mean, 20 dislocations out of 2,132. Our number's better than that. But it's a really an amazing thing. And nobody said, you, You're crazy. Nobody, nobody does it that way. Well, now, not everybody, but some of us do it that way. So this is the beauty of a, of a direct anterior approach. Um, you can get out of the hospital in 12 to 24 hours. There's no hip precautions. If you want to sit like that, with your knee bent like that, I have a surgery, you can do that. If you want to wait there the same day, if you want to get out of bed and go to the bathroom, whatever, get a drink of water, first of all, you can able to do that. And second of all, you can do it. And bilateral surgery, beautiful. I mean, in these younger cats, you need to get going. Uh, there's a guy who's out of King's Mountain, who's a big banker, and he said, you know, you think you can do both of them, I gotta get back to golf, and he was out, the plane's down in Key West, and two weeks later. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's an amazing, it's an absolutely amazing surgery. Um, and this is what it looks like. See that right there? Eight centimeters. That's, that, in real life, that's that, right there in front of your hip. And so what happens is this red line is the incision on the skin, and it goes right about here. So what we do is, We'll put a retractor there and a retractor there. And I'll make a double cut. Take out this piece of bone to give me enough room. So I can take the head out. And then we resurface this, put a cut in there. And then I put a, uh, a, a plastic liner in that. And then I open up the stem of the canal and put a stem. Then I put a ceramic head. It takes us 45 minutes. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> out the door. Literally, eight centimeters. Now, if you look at bigger, we may have to go to 10 centimeters. <laughs> um, this is the guy we did. Uh, this actually is this fellow's hips. And you can see here, which is really kind of cool, because one of the things that we always, 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 always worry about is leg length. Okay? So what we do now at the time of surgery is everybody has this point and everybody has that point. So obviously between two points, you can draw a straight line. And you can see how this piece of bone is called lesser choke, hits right there, hits the exact same spot on the opposite side. So while you're lying on the table, I got one of the best ways to make sure. Now let's say we just did this hip. Well, on that hip, you wouldn't have any input, but you still have that piece of bone. And so I can measure that normal piece of bone and make this one move it up or down to match that one over there. So that's really another big advantage of doing a direct anterior hip. So we, when you do a direct anterior hip, people we'll call it zipper hip. Okay. Um, you don't cut any muscle, you don't cut any ligament, you don't cut any tendon. When, when you get through the skin, you move the muscles to the side, take out a little bit of fat, and you go right down 
So this capsule right here, which takes us about five minutes, and then we're out of the cup in about 15. And actually, we spend a lot of time doing this number, trying to get it symmetrical down to the side. You won't know three millimeters, but I would say probably 98% of the time we're within three millimeters of the opposite side, and probably close to 99% of the time we're within four or five millimeters. Five millimeters you might feel, but after about six months it kind of goes away, you don't notice the difference, okay? Um, now what do, you, what do you expect? I mean, really, total hips and total knee surgery, she was reported relief of pain in 97, 95% of the patients. That's probably true. It's the pain, you gotta get rid of it. Once you get rid of that pain and you walk through it, the more you move it, the quicker it gets you rid of the pain. You gotta get rid of that weakness. Get rid of that pain, your, your strength will come back. So that's why people go to surgery most commonly. Leg extensor power, you've gotta have a quadriceps step, the strength, so you can walk faster, stair climb, climb stairs, and so you can squat. Most people get that um, leg extensor power within the first six months. If you come in and say, oh, my knee's giving away, my implants are moving. Uh, your implants aren't moving, you didn't do your quad exercises. You come in and you try to straighten this knee out nice and strong, you straighten, you straighten out. This one is like, man, well, come on, this is. And you know, it's, it's really what you put into it. So if you're willing to do the exercises and get the range of motion, your pain will go away very quickly. You'll do very, very well. And if not, then you're gonna get some, the dreaded stiff knee. The stiff knee is terrible. What about range of motion? This is the second reason why people come and see us to get threatened by the painfulness, decreased function. And in general, most range of motion after a knee is achieved in six months. You need 90 degrees to walk and 110, 20, 110, 100 to 100 degrees to, to climb stairs. So if you come in and your knee's at 90 degrees, you're tattooed. I mean, you're not gonna get it done. I mean, nobody in this room wants to go through all that surgery and not be able to walk. That's insane, you know? When you only need 90 degrees, I mean, that's not a lot. But you need that, you gotta have that. If you wanna climb stairs without looking like, you know, you're 90 years old, then you gotta get 100 degrees, 120 degrees. If you get 125, and a lot, most people do, you can pretty much do whatever you want. You can play tennis, you can golf, you can, you know, cross country ski, you can swim, you can ride a bike, you can get on a treadmill. You can do all sorts of things. You just can't run. You can do anything else. Mm -hmm. Anything we want to do in our age groups, we can do it. But the total knee and the total hip. So you got to get the range of motion. That's you got the strength and the range of motion. Um, primary goal of the total knee range of motion is full <coughs> extension by two months. You, you got to get it straight. If you don't get it straight, you're going to have a limp. Uh, you got to tell people until you're blue in the face, and then finally keep pressing it, pressing it, pressing it. So by two months at the latest, I want to see that. Because if I, because if I can't get, if, you're at ten, if you come to the office three months after surgery and you're at 10 degrees, you know what I gotta do? I gotta open that knee. Mm -hmm. I gotta open it. Because I'm not gonna get it with PT. It's not. You're not, you're not gonna get it because now you're stiff in the back. You gotta, this prevents a limb and close to a knee pain. You need to get 120, 225 degrees inflection. That's really what the goal is. Those other goals are just like minimum. Those are absolute minimum. You get a stiff knee, you're unhappy. Your wife's unhappy. Your dog's unhappy. And I'm really unhappy. <laughs> because that's, I mean, I just know you've gone through so much. And then to get a stiff knee, there's no easy solution. No easy solution. And you're miserable, okay? So if you're gonna, if you're gonna embark on this, then you need to be educated. You gotta get ready for it. It's like any other race. And most people do very, very well, especially in this community, because they don't want to look like wool, well, you know? I don't want to do that. You gotta, you gotta keep your feet and you know, you As I've learned as I've gotten older, I don't want to look old. I mean, it's okay, I can't do anything about the mirror today. I mean, that's it. But I can still do what I gotta do because I want to get things done. Because now I might have time to do it. Well, maybe I don't right now, but I, one day soon, I hope. Um, drive, people are, people are worldwide, especially in this country. You gotta have 90 degrees of motion. Good quadriceps strength, not use narcotics. And if you really are good, you're not using narcotics. You can be driving in two weeks, maybe even four weeks. With a hip, you'll be driving in three days. Wow. Is, is that, that driving the limitation, like if it's a, a right leg, or is that just any injury? That's a very good question. I think it, I think to answer directly your question, obviously if you do your left knee, you're gonna be able to go a little bit further. 
a little bit quicker. I mean, right, because they're, your right leg is your drive leg. But even if it, this is this is the price to your driving leg, your right leg. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you move and you do the ice and you, and you get rid of those narcotics, <coughs> because unfortunately, you know, we're, we're not in probably another three four years, narcotics is not going to be a big option. It's going to go away. Slower and slower and slower. There's some guys, believe it or not, some guys in California send their total joints home on Tramadol. They don't even use narcotics. Do you do, you, do you do both knees at the same time? It's a great operation. <laughs> it's a great operation. It's a great operation. It's a great operation. Because sometimes it happens, you guys come in and you, you know, carry one fist and this is a little painful, so I'm not going to do that one. So, you know, heck no, I'm going to do both at the same time. As soon as you can push up from a chair with the hands, your rehab will be as if you only have one knee done. And I only do bilateral knees at this hospital over here. Four years ago, they said, nobody does told me that's barbaric surgery. Well, we've proven that hundreds of times that that's not barbaric surgery. Because now what they do, they go from there. Now, they, now we don't even have to call for a room. We've got a room on reservation. We've got a standing reservation. So you go over here for two days, and you, then you walk down the hall to acute rehab, and then they bang on you for another 10 days. And by the time you need another 12 days, you're in your man. You're not paying free, but you really are moving along because they pay a lot of close attention. Plus, if you're over there, they won't come by and see you. And if we're not happy, you have to talk to somebody. But if you're in a skilled nursing facility, I can't see you. But if you do bilateral autonomy, and that's one of the things that Medicare lets you do is go to the acute rehab. It's different than the skilled nursing facility. The acute rehab, it's all the time we really put in that chain. So yeah, that's, bilateral autonomy is a great operation. Bilateral total hips is even better operation. Because <laughs> those guys go in a couple of days. Yeah, well, the, the theory of being is if you're bow like it, you've got that problem. If you did one, you got a D. it was straight, and then <laughs> the other one would be screwed up. Yeah, and that other one will take more burden. This really will take more burden. Yeah, I, I would say the only way I don't do bilateral anything is if you're over 75 and you have heart disease or lung disease. Because the literature tells us those guys are going to get in trouble. But anything other than that, and we've got to have a hemoglobin 13, you just move. It works really, really well. We move very quickly. I can, again, we're going to need about 35 on each side, and for hips about 45 on each side. It was very nice. It's a very nice operation. And I will tell you too, the literature strongly supports that if you do both things at the same time, you have a lower risk of infection. Because you only get one shot at it. Rather than going to the hospital twice and you know. And you get out in two days now, so you're not hanging out. <coughs> do, not, do, not, do not go to the skill nursing facility. One of the things we thought about doing was actually um, not doing the surgery unless you had a coach. I don't care who it is. You know, but you got if you buy if you sign if somebody signs a coach obligation. You're not going to go to skilled nursing facility because I can tell you right now, guarantee, hands down, non-debate, no debate. Most readmissions come from skilled nursing facilities. If you've got a wife or a friend to take care of you, they're going to take a hell of a lot better care of you than the people who are getting paid eight bucks an hour. <laughs> you're not going to be sitting in your urine. You're going to be at home being taken care of by people who love you. And I really, truly, truly think that's a big difference. Huge, huge difference. Again, 95, 96 percent go home. You don't want to go to skilled nursing facility. And those people who don't have somebody, you kind of beg, you gotta find somebody. I mean, you gotta have a friend somewhere. <laughs> you know, even I got friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that they're out there. They're out there. Um, total hip replacement for these guys is it's just they're rockets. They're really rockets. They're discharged in less than 23 hours, and the functional range of motion three to four days. They're off pain medications in a week. They walk in assistance in seven days and return to work in 14 days. Wow. So for all these cats that still out there producing incomes. Get a direct call and get back to work in two weeks. That's like a long holiday. <laughs> so it's, it's really it's a great operation. I, I, you know, now it's not perfect. Don't get me wrong. It's not perfect. But if there's any way that you want to get back to work and you need to go ahead, do it this way. Go to the front. You know, I'm not the only one who does it, but don't worry anybody who doesn't go to the front. Even if it's in California or Chicago or whatever. Just want to talk about this real quick. Like we went to that beat this horse to death, but it really is um, really really big. And it's a dry. It's only one matrix that they use, um, but it it really is consequential to hundreds of millions of billions of dollars. I mean, that's going to really hurt some hospitals when they draw. They claw back that money the next year when they do their results, and all of a sudden you think you made you have a whack year. The margin on most hospitals is only like two and a half percent. 
If you're taking back hundreds of millions of dollars, that two and a half percent is gone. Um, decrease utilization, we have to say we do that. Decrease mental status, we do that. Increase aggressive physical therapy, we do that. All these things, we have different ways. And take, for example, one of the most recent things we've done was that um, we use a dressing now on our knees and our hips. We have a honeycomb dressing that we put on in the operating room when your incision is the clean as it's ever gonna be. And that dressing stays on for seven days. So your dog can't lick it, you know, the nurse can't blow her nose and change your dressing. It stays on there for seven days. And if you gotta take it off, we give you another one to put it back on. But I don't want you know, to show you how to do that. But if nobody touches it, by the time that dressing comes off, everything's already pretty much healed. So you don't probably don't even need a second dressing. And we don't use staples, it's all skin glue. In other words, you're gonna get pretty amazing. Okay. There's no staples, no, those are hurt, those are pain, those are painful. So, forget this guy. So what's happened here in Centara? I won't tell you. We've really, really been having the privilege of having you guys let us take care of you. Um, but this is really, I think, a really proud moment because they won the high performance for total hips and total knees. And across the entire United States, only 11% or 10% of hospitals rated this procedure get high performance. And only us in St. Mary's and Richmond are the only two hospitals that get both ratings at the same time for knees and hips. So that was, that was a big, we got that last year, and uh, that was really something else. Um, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Blue Distinction, I mean, these guys, these guys, you know what they're like, they're really like, you know, it's like three letters, you know, talking about such a mess. And they, uh, they really picked who they want their patients to go, and so we got their Blue Distinction, which is really pretty good for our center. And, and the other one thing about it is, you got to have enough volume to compete, and if you're doing 100 joints a year, you're not really going to compete. But I think in the last two, three years, we've increased the percentage of 212 percent. So we've really jacked it up here. But we, so but they gave us a lot of latitude. We got it's really kind of funny because I'm one of the dudes who actually enjoy hips here. So Bob Gray, I don't know if anybody knows him. He was the president of the hospital. I was sitting down. I said, Well, what do you need to come up here? What's the, what's the deal? I said, Well, I need a Hannah table to do my direct anterior hips. And he says, Well, how many do you need? I mean, he's a really enthusiastic guy. He says, How many do you need? I said. Uh, well, Bob, it costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars a piece. So can you get by? Can you get by with just one? And so I can only do one hip at a time. So I think I can do it. But that, I mean, they were very energetic, and you know, they've really done very. Uh, they've done a lot for us. They really, really have. Um, so, um, and then of course everybody probably knows that they won the Truman Award, which is the only hospital in Virginia to be ranked among the top one hundred and the top twenty. So it's one thousand medium-sized hospitals. That's, you got up there looking at lowering the stage, readmission rate, expenses, complication rates, deaths, and they score better on patient surveys. If you guys aren't happy, that stuff gets all gets reported to Medicare. And if you got unhappy patients, cut. They want you guys to be happy, which makes sense to me too. So the treatment award, it's really great. Top 100 out of 20 hundred evaluated hospitals. So basically what happens is like, you know, things are changing. But we're changing with them. We're just trying to stay ahead of them. Do as much as we can to keep ahead of the keep ahead of the game. Keep the hospital and the system black. But more importantly, keep you guys so we can get things that we need. The better we are, the more we go in the front door and say, we need this, we need this. Like that Argon Blade's not cheap, but they'll buy it because we get results that we need. Because that's what we need to get you guys moving. And it's really amazing. I would say 10, 15 years ago, um, if somebody comes off, I just tell them they're gonna check a blood level, get a urine, you know. Send, you know, send them off to Red Cross to get a blood tank, you know, transfuse your blood, and you know, put a big old bulky dressing on there, lay in bed for three days, and you know, have your ass hanging up, excuse me, sister. Now it's completely different. Now, day of surgery, then you, you get back in street clothes. You know, and you're moving, you're out of there. You know, you can move very quickly. Um, we learned a lot, and, and I really think at the end of the day, especially since I'm getting older now, and I have a lot of respect for every day. You know, you wake up in the morning, you put it on the next day. So you don't want to be messing around with this stuff. You want to get in and get out. Yes, sir. Uh, it sounds like it's your relatively new wing for the brief history.